Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Podinar series of Global Summit. Uh, I'm here today as a host. My name is Raquel Tita Gomes. I'm from Portugal. I'm an oral surgeon uh, with a master degree specialization in PhD in implantology. And I'm very honored today to present Dr. Dennis Smiley from the United States. Uh, the topic for today will be uh, welcome to the world of successful implant practice. And of course, I'm going to present a little bit our guest that is a uh, very well known uh, worldwide doing lectures uh, about several topics. And I'm going to read a little bit his bio so everyone understands his TV. Uh, then we're going to do the podcast part of the webinar and then the webinar part with Dr. Smiley. And then if you have questions, you can put your questions in the, in the message. And then at the end, we will come back and uh, uh, have the questions to Dr. Dennis. So um, Dr. Dennis Smiler is uh, graduated from the University of Pennsylvania uh, School of Dentistry in 1964. So a long time ago. Oh, How long have you born yet? <laughs> oh, thank you. That makes me feel so. wonderful. <laughs> And uh, what I like a lot, I, I love UPenn because I also went there as uh, invited lecturers uh, two years ago, um, invited by Marcus Watts, and uh, it's a marvelous uh, uh, university and in the yes. best ranking in the world. So congratulations on that. Um, and he attended Boston University too, where there is a school of dentistry, earning a master in science degree in 1968. Uh, following an internship and residency in oral surgery uh, at Roosevelt Hospital in New York. Uh, he returned to California in 1969 and established his oral surgery practice in LA and Encino. Dr. Smiley is an educator uh, of dental implantology. He has published numerous articles in the dental professional literature and contributed to periodicals and test books. He lectures extensively and participates in symposiums throughout the country and internationally at universities and implant conferences. The first time I met uh, Dr. Dennis Smiler, it was in a conference in Maastricht uh, precisely seven years ago. So I, I had the, the pleasure to meet him in, in person. Uh, he was lecturing there uh, in 2013. Uh, Doctors from around the world attended seminars and courses and live surgical demonstrations to receive training in dental implantology. So Dr. Smiler is a diploma, diplomat of several organizations, I will read some. So it's an extensive CV, uh, the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, the International Congress of Oral Implantology, uh, the American Congress of Oral Implantology, and the American Society of Osteoinflation. And is a fellow also of several organizations, namely International Congress of Oral Implantology, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, the American Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeon, uh, Surgeons, and the International Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. Um, he also enjoys work, uh, and we can see that because he's still working uh, after all these years and still teaching. Uh, but uh, he sometimes feels that he's very away from uh, his home, so sometimes he feels a little bit <laughs> guilty. And uh, now, after COVID, probably is trying to compensate that uh, with the family. And I also know what what that is. So, welcome, Dr. Dennis Smiler. Thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation to do this webinar. I'm really honored to present yourself because you're a role model in terms of the oral and maxillofacial surgery. And uh, I met you personally many years ago. I hope in the future we can uh, meet again. After this COVID uh, problems uh, arrive, I know that you are also doing some courses in, in Brazil uh, with Dr. Salboni and others. So I would like to ask you first, uh, because the first time I met you, I was uh, really interested in one topic that you, you talked about. It was about the stem cells um, of bone marrow that you were collecting to mix with the um, biomaterial for biostimulation. And I know you have a lot of research on, on that topic. Can you talk uh, a little bit of, about uh, this, uh, this subject, please? Well, thank you. And thank you for that very, very nice introduction, you know. And I do hope we'll be able to get back to meet in person again. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, 
in our teaching. So the number of years ago, before the lecture in, in Maastricht, I was doing some research on the stem cells and it was all independent. So there was nobody who was concerned about this, no journals, mm -hmm. no, no companies. So it was just <clears throat> pure research. And it found that when we went into the bone marrow with a very simple you know, procedure with a needle, as you saw from the lecture, to gather the stem cells and add that to our graft material, we were having inordinate success, more success with our graft procedures. So at that time, I stopped doing autogenous bone grafting because in the histology, we were seeing that with an allograft and stem cells. You have better results. Not as good, but better, better mm -hmm. results. So up until recently, I was only doing the bone marrow aspiration, but about three years ago, I started some research on using uh, umbilical cord stem cells. Wow. So now I have not done the uh, bone marrow aspiration because I've researched a very good laboratory here, a tissue bank that gives me excellent stem cells. So in the bone marrow aspirin, there was possible to get maybe 0.005% of mesenchymal stem cells. Mm -hmm. When I am doing this with umbilical cord stem cells, I am getting greater than 25% mesenchymal stem cells. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no reason now, even as simple as it is, you know, to do the bone marrow. Actually, the only reason I guess would be is that the, the you have the additional cost of stem cells, you know, from mm -hmm. the tissue bank, whereas with the bone marrow aspiration, no. But the problem is, is that if you're doing this on a patient who's 60, 70 years old, you're getting 70 year old stem cells. If we're yeah. taking umbilical cord stem cells, we're getting very, fresh. very active, fresh stem cells. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot to a lot of advantage. So now that has changed. Yeah, but at least in the United States, you have this uh, possibility. Here in Portugal, not all the uh, the, the babies are collected with the, the stem cells of the cord. So probably we we'll don't don't have that uh, chance in all the people. But uh, it's good to know that you are researching. Uh, to go even further, and that uh, you are doing more uh, research, e even with the uh, umbilical cord or uh, stem cells. Um, and uh, what about your practice? You you practice some private practice or uh, in hospitals or both? What is your your uh, daily uh, daily life? Well, about uh, maybe now 12, 15 years ago, I finally sold my practice. Mm -hmm. and I retired and I retired for maybe three days because it was impossible for me not to work. <laughs> and, uh, now I do share a practice where just routine oral surgery and still have a hospital practice. But most of the cases now for the hospital practice are um, implants, bone grafting, and now doing zygoma and pterygoid stem cells. Mm -hmm. so I do not do at these time, this time trauma because I let mm -hmm. the younger doctors take the emergency call and come in to do trauma. It's I also will, necessary. <laughs> I, will assist, yeah, I will happily assist, but I'm not going to do that. the next right. generation. No, let the younger ones come in and do that. But it's quite impressive uh, because you are working si since uh, 1968 or something. So it's quite <laughs> impressive that even today you are passionate about what you're doing, passionate about teaching, passionate about working. It's, it's quite impressive. I hope I'll, I will be with the same enthusiasm in a few years because it's really uh, impressive. Um, and uh, you told about zygomatic, about pterygoid, and I know that you are doing some courses at least uh, before COVID uh, situation. And let's hope that in the future um, it will back to normal uh, in Brazil with Dr. Salvoni and uh, with some couple of collaborations. Um, do you, you want me to tell uh, what type of programs that are you collaborating in, in, in Brazil? Yes, sure. Can you please? Oh, so the courses that we do in Brazil are, are live surgery. So doctors come from or actually around the world to do the surgery because usually, for instance, in the United States, if I do the courses here, someone coming from an international 
you know, reason is not able to do surgery because they don't have. Yes, license, because of the law. You know, in here. But in Brazil, we now accommodate anywhere from 10, 12 or 16 doctors at a time. And they come for four days. So one day is purely lecture, didactic, practicing on models. Um, then they rest for a day. As I told you, the reason we spend the day resting is because we have docs that come from, for instance, New Zealand or China yeah. or Hong Kong, and they're jet lag. So I don't want them. 12 hours, so it's yes, quite difficult. Yes. So I don't want them to start doing surgery when they're still jet lagged. So then we have three days of just doing surgery. And we do zygomas, mostly zygomas and pterygoids. And of mm -hmm. the zygomas, almost all the zygomas are quad. Quadra, right. And, and is, we, it, yeah. is it in a, a hospital that you do this or private? Um, no, we do this in the clinic. Actually, we do mm -hmm. the clinic with uh, Dr. Salvoni, and he's part of the FOCA, the university. So we have that facility, you know. To oh, do. great. And then there's a wonderful faculty that we have in Brazil of Dr. Salvoni and his faculty from the university. So everyone has a doctor looking over their shoulder while they're control. Away, right but the surgery is wonderful but getting together and having this nice collegiate atmosphere with it's all awesome. the doctors we go to the uh, central market on sunday for food and walk around the market go to avenida calista you know and walk around there and do so it's very enjoyable and it's very beautiful brazil the weather the beaches um all the people are very friendly uh, I, I really like Brazil because I'm Portuguese, so uh, they speak Portuguese, and I, I also go up in some courses there, and um, I have a very good relation uh, with Brazilian doctors uh, because we speak also the same language, so uh, it's quite intercultural uh, between oh, Portugal yes, and Brazil. Yes. So, so I have been back, I think um, uh, I was down in Brazil in Rio maybe 30, 35 years ago to do some surgery on one of the important people in Brazil, but lecturing in uh, Fortaleza, in Curitiba. Uh, Curitiba, yeah. in the south. And, and of course, also going to Iguazu. We have nice Iguazu. 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 So Brazil is a very, very beautiful country. Just wonderful. Yeah, and very different from north to south. Uh, very different uh, landscapes is very, very nice. Um, about uh, I saw your CV uh, and it's quite brilliant and you are on all these academies and fellowships and masters and um, what you know, about when your in, yeah, when you're your in fact research. long enough if you're in fact <laughs> long enough you get to have a lot of things on your shot yes yeah but what about uh, the research what type of topics now you you are researching more or you you feel that is more important to to share with us. I know you, you did research in a lot of topics, but what topic is the most, uh, you know, uh, important for you? Well, obviously, you know, the stem cells were important, but the other thing that I did, again, is just a private, you know, investigator. We took the allograph materials that everyone uses that tells us that this is osseoinductive. Mm -hmm. uh, it is osseoinductive, but it's osseoinductive in rats. It's, don't think it transmits. It is in humans. In humans. So what I did is we drew bone marrow aspiration and peripheral blood on each patient and then sent them to my lab that I was using in Washington and analyzed everything for ribonucleic acid and also sent them the products without knowing what the products were and had them analyzed for ribonucleic acid. And of course, you would know that. No I remember to see that in your presentation about the CD34, uh, CD. Yeah, 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 exactly. Compared exactly. the bone peripheral and uh, the bone marrow. I remember that. And it was yeah. seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad for the memory. But what, it, what it tells me is that uh, it, the allograph material is, is a nice matrix in order mm -hmm. to support the material, but it still goes back to basics. And mm -hmm. if you need to have cytokines and growth factors, you're much better off taking them, you know, from the patient 
spinning the blood and using the cytokine growth factors there. Uh, even if you do not want to do that, we find that if you just draw blood and don't spin it down, you have yeah. an increase in cytokine growth factors. Exactly. So the idea that you can rely on the allogeneic material to start forming bone, I think is false. Yeah. And also, I know you also have experience using uh, just blood as a, um, a complement of uh, mixing with the uh, xenograft and allograft. And a lot of people are using now is a new trend, uh, the PRF, the PRP, the uh, LPRF, all the, the, the different techniques. I, I used some of them uh, a few years ago, and now I'm, I'm using more the, the PRF because I think it's more biological. We don't have any external components to activate. or. Uh, but uh, I know that it's not the same thing. But uh, do you have experience also using uh, this kind of plasma? Um, in your practice and in, 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 in the teaching? You know, it's, it's, thank you for asking me that because it brings back a memory of, again, maybe about 30 years ago, uh, Dr. Carl Mish and I were both doing a presentation and we sat down to see what we could do in order to increase stem cell cytokines. And at that time, all we did was draw blood and spin it down in a, just mm -hmm. a, a centrifuge that they use for hematology. And so it did increase our success. And then from that, we started doing PRP. Mm -hmm. and I also doctors, it. Yeah, and they were saying, not a doctors who I respect said PRP does not work. And there was a lot of other doctors I also had great respect for said it works. So really they were asking the wrong question. They wanted to know, they should know, why does it work in one situation and not the other? Mm -hmm. And the obvious answer is cells the PRP and the cytokine growth factors can only work on cells. So you need to get the stem cells that are there. Yeah. So if you're doing this in dense cortical bone and you haven't, you don't have any uh, stem cells or decortication, it's not going to work. Exactly. In current time, I use uh, concentrated growth factors. So we can do PRP or CGF. And mm -hmm. most of the cases now are done, which in my practice, We'll draw the blood, maybe four to six, you know, carpules or you know, mm -hmm. tooth, and spin it down. And we'll spin it down for their cytokine growth factors that we use for membranes. Yeah, and it's good for even to to mix the biomaterial and to aggregate the biomaterial. Oh, absolutely, it's a great vehicle of uh, of uh, putting <laughs> the biomaterial in place and not having granules everywhere. Because in some countries, for instance, in Portugal, we can't uh, use allograft. Uh, we we only can do uh, autogenous, but uh, like, uh, but not cadavers, and uh, or xenograft. So we don't have the, the, the chance to, to use allograft. Uh, so normally, or we do or blocks or um, trephines to, to 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 remove the bone from the the, the patient to use in, in the patient. Or sometimes you have to use uh, xenograft, and many times we mix with the, the PRF and with the IPRF or the PRP, and it, it is much more uh, easy uh, to work. And also we, we have the, the soluble uh, growth factors that will help the, the healing, namely the, the soft tissue healing. So uh, I think at least in that it's, it's a great uh, uh, way of, uh, of working in surgery. At least is my experience. No, it's the same. And the fact is, is that once we started working with stem cells and other materials like GEM21, who does also gives us uh, a yeah. lot of information, getting the uh, mitosis and the attraction of cells to our graft site. But I have not taken, as I said, autogenous bone. So and before I would go into the hip mm -hmm. and take bone. Well, the oral surgery procedure was easy. The patients had no complaints, but they complained about their hip. Yeah, and that that's the problem. problem. Yeah. So I have not done that in 15 years. Taking mm -hmm. from the hip. It's just not necessary with the newer technologies that we have. So I think with the younger docs that are coming up, that are going to be exposed in their training about stem, stem cells, cytokines, growth factors, and the requirements. And all these new right? technologies. Yes, 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 yes. And you know, it's even now when we're doing zygomas, the zygoma surgery, 
So we can take the raw data, the DICOM images, send them off to a lab that I use, and we come back with the exact model of the treatment. treatment. Yeah. We used to treat this all just, I would do it on the, uh, on the uh, CT scan. Mm -hmm. but now we have the procedure, we do it on the model. And yeah, on the general lithographic model. Absolutely. Uh, the lecture I give on, on zygoma planning is really going back to our basic geometry of points, lines, and angles. So that once we prefer perform the procedure on the models, you make a surgical template and yeah. you line up the points. It's safer. And it's it's a it's not a slam dunk. You still need a lot of work, but exactly. it makes it a lot easier. I would caution that before the doc, any of the surgeons start doing zygomas and they start doing this with the Guided. model and the guide first they have, they have to do, to do it freehand <laughs> yes yes because you have no idea what to do if things go wrong or exactly. you're not exactly in the right place but yeah. I, I think that rule is the same for everything in that three uh all the implantology nowadays many companies uh, like to sell that uh, guided is so easy guided i think guided is easy if you know what you're doing and if you know how to solve the problems and have like uh, brain guided surgery first, and then you yeah. can work with guides. But if you don't know how to do a flap, how to, uh, you know, how to solve uh, oral and drug communication, how to deal with the nerve, how to do, of course, something is going to go wrong. Uh, so I, I totally agree uh, because my, I have my, also my education in a school of oral surgery but we didn't have guides, uh, so I started 18 well, years ago, exactly. and everything was free-handed. And, and uh, we also exposed like, everything uh, to yeah. see properly and to see the anatomical uh, uh, structures. And I think it's guided could be good, uh, but it's still, uh, it shouldn't be uh, felt as something miraculous, because it's not. And it's well, still... Yeah, having some issues of sometimes uh, even the CVCTs, okay, or, or the TCs, uh, sometimes are not uh, perfect. They have some uh, distortions. Yeah, the problem. yeah, the problem is that if some of the doctor picks up the guide, what we find you when we're teaching this with our implant course and we do a guide, we don't know whether or not you are guiding the guide or is the guide guiding you exactly so, and if they have don't have the basics like we do when we first started doing implants without guides exactly in the position then they end up with them guiding the guide rather than having the guide yeah. take them exactly yeah. where they want to be so most of the cases that i'm sure you know with your practice also uh the guides are helpful but i still go back to doing my cases freehand yeah. once I know where I want the implants to be. Totally agree. And I have the same philosophy yeah. also, not only in um, surgeries uh, with zygomas, even in uh, general implantology, uh, many people are trying to do everything like this. And I think, uh, yeah, probably will be the no. future, but if you don't know how to solve the problems, that will not uh, end well, because uh, if you don't know how to solve the complication, uh, it's, it's 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 like doing endo. If you know how to do manual endo, you will do it uh, with a machine quite fast. But if you don't know how to do it manual, if you don't have the machine, you can't do it manual. It's it's the same. Uh, the well, same one, of my, uh, one of my teachers that I remember very well is saying was, yeah. "The slower you go, the faster you get there." Yeah. And that's really true. And this is not a time just for doing surgery. And, and like uh, Scott Gans says, sometimes you have to be brain guided, uh, not digital <laughs> guided, but brain guided. <laughs> so I think it's true. a very good expression. Uh, you have to know first what you are doing and how to solve the complications. And then you can go like uh, guided by uh, the, the softwares and uh, all this new yeah. stuff. But well, still you have to, to, to have a hand and the brain to solve the problems because you're, you're still a doctor, not a machine. Uh, and that I, I think is the, the real deal uh, 
is, is that to, to, to solve the complications, is the difference between being a good doctor and a, an excellent doctor is to solve the complication, not the indicators. <laughs> You know, we find that when part of the course we teach is like doing lateral nerve repositioning. And the first thought is, oh, my God, how can I, you're going to touch the nerve, you're going to remove the nerve. I know. And it's, it is not that complicated, as you know, to do the procedure. Exactly. If you follow the basic guidelines. And the protocols. And, and, and the uh, I, I, I'm very uh, comfortable on, on talking about that because uh, one of my specialties is nerve trans transposition and nerve lateralization and trespass. And I also learned it in, uh, in Brazil and I started to do it about seven years and I have a, a lot of referral cases because uh, people are very afraid to do it. But when you do it properly with a, a trained team, with everything very controlled, uh, uh, with the uh, vitamin uh, uh, B uh, to, to stimulate and uh, laser therapy to stimulate the, the temporary paresthesia with piezo, with all the, 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 the basic guidelines, it's, it's not so complicated uh, surgery and it's a very successful one. And people are so stressed out with just seeing the nerve, how much, you know, and when they, yeah. I'm saying, okay, but you, you can retract the nerve and put in the, People, you are crazy. You must be crazy. No. Okay. No, the, it's, it's uh, I wrote the paper. I wrote a paper on the nerve repositioning maybe 25 years ago. And at the time, people were having a lot of paresthesia trying to do this surgery because in what I was reading is that they were also taking out the nerve from the mental foramen and redoing a mental foramen. So the article that I wrote was to make a the vertical bone cut behind the mental foramen mm -hmm. and make that window very very large the problem is, is that if they make the window small as you know it's difficult to manipulate the nerve exactly if you make a large window and this is the other thing i learned is that uh, in residency big surgeons make big incisions <laughs> and, and they slap and like to see everything flat. You want to see everything. You can't operate unless you see it. And you're right. The lateral nerve repositioning, once you have the technique and we teach, is not any more difficult. It's just following the, the protocol. Yeah, exactly. I agree. And uh, But it's still a myth, you know. Uh, people are very scared about doing it. I do also a lot of courses of teaching these techniques. Uh, but some some even doctors they do the course but then they don't feel so comfortable to do the procedure because right. they are afraid to do it uh, by their own if they are with someone besides it's okay but uh, you know exactly. uh, but so they, they feel that they need something someone to to be on the shoulder you know controlling and uh, if something goes wrong how to solve the problems uh, but it's a very uh, uh, successful technique and a very predictable one. But Especially of course, you now, have to know because, yeah. what you're doing, like the zygomatic or like uh, yeah. sinus, which is all, they have all the, some uh, technical uh, uh, particularities, but if you know what you're doing and you have trained and you have all the, the guidelines and the, uh, all the material, the right materials, they will work because they are proved to work for many years. You are not trying something new. It's something that is more than described in the literature. But if you go back to when I wrote the paper, I was using just a, a round burr, number six or a number eight round burr to make yeah. it cut. Now we have piezo. Now we have piezo. So it makes yeah. it even that much easier. Much easier. And what happens is a lot of the doctors who are afraid to do it, it's good and bad because now they understand the procedure that can be done, but they refer it to me or to you to do the surgery. Yeah, but it's not so, and with piezo, because piezo doesn't cut soft tissue, if you know how to use the piezo, it will not be so risky. Of course, you have to have a team, a team that is trained, because when you are putting the implant, someone is have to retract the nerve or not pushing too much, and all this stuff, all the assistants have to know where to suction and or not suction, or, you know, to retract or not to retract. But if you have a very well-trained uh, uh, team, it's not so difficult to do it in a very predictable and uh, uh, successful way. And you know, and this really just introduce what I'm going to be t discussing today in the lecture. I am sure that my audience, the audience that is listening to this presentation, have been doing implants for a long time. 
So what I tried to do here is to bring together that I thought were the absolute non-negotiable points that you must consider before doing implants. Yeah. And I not apologizing to the docs who are very well experienced because we always relearn these basic techniques and what's in responsible. And once you forget the basics, then you start running into trouble and not doing yeah. your cases very well. So the lecture today will be mainly it's welcome to the world of implantology, but I want to discuss what I think are the important concepts for successful cases. At the future lectures, in, we'll talk about planning for zygomas and planning for pterygoids and show some cases. But again, it all goes back to basics and the anatomy. Yeah, totally agree. Many times in my lectures, I, I started the slides saying, going back to basics. <laughs> Yeah. And I, go, I always start uh, explaining the basics because if you know well the basics, you will do everything uh, properly and uh, uh, with scientific background and the clinical background and everything will be fine. So I think uh, now it's time for you to share your knowledge with us um, so uh, you can uh, share your screen and do your presentation and uh, in, at the end I will come again and uh, if we have some questions from the public, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. Okay? Okay. So I'm Thank going to... Thank you so much that. for accepting our challenge. Let's see if this works. So I'll share the screen. That's perfect. Uh, and now that's perfect. All right. Wait. Not just yet. So... I want to take this picture off. So let's see, save. How do I get back now to the lecture? You need to probably close and uh, open it again and then share the presentation. Okay, let's see. I'm going to close. Yeah, it's better to close and then start again. And then share again the screen. Below the camera, share screen. Okay, I'm going to try that in a second. Is it there? Well, I hope this is um, working now. Is it possible to give me some affirmation that everybody is seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah, it's working fine. Please proceed. All right. Thank you. So again, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for taking your time this morning to uh, listen to this uh, webinar or Podmore, Podmore. And as I was explaining that I do realize that I'm presenting to doctors who are very well experienced with implant dentistry. But my aim then today is just to present what I have found is going to be or should be the essentials and non-negotiables that I have found over my more than 40 years of doing implant dentistry. And it really relates to the fact that no matter what implant system you're currently using in your practice, what I want to show is what I think are the concepts that must be considered. So as was done on my introduction, I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. I've been starting my active practice after residency about 1970 and a number of organizations because you're in once you're in practice for a longer period of time, there are a lot of organizations that you become a member of. 
So I want to welcome everybody to the world of implant dentistry. And the first thing to realize in doing this is that implant dentistry is basically a prosthetic modality that has a surgical component to it. As an oral surgeon, I like to think that I am, in fact, the most important member of the implant team. However, that's not the case. The important thing to remember that this is a prosthetically driven surgical procedure. So when we're learning implant dentistry, there are two things we have to do, and that is to master the theory and then master the practice. And it is the blending of the theory and the practice that is going to make you more experienced and then becoming really probably a master you know, of implant dentistry. It takes time. This is not a spectator sport. You have to do this surgery. As we talked about earlier in the introduction, we're doing zygomas and pterygoid implants. It takes practice and practice and practice. Even if you're a well-established you know, maxillofacial surgeon, you still takes practice in order to blend the theory with the practical standpoint. So I begin with what I consider non-negotiables. Um, cancellous versus cortical bone, um, understanding of biologic width and biotype. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Dr. Dennis. Uh, I think the presentation is not in full screen mode. Can you please go full screen? Um, let's see. If, if... I don't know how to go into full stream. Is still not on full stream? No, not yet. Well, I sorry, I do not know what to do. Yeah, now it's full screen, yeah. Okay, but then I want to go back to presentation mode. Is it still full screen? No, not yet. Okay. And now? No, not in full screen. Oh, that's a problem. Okay. All right, we're at full screen now, correct? Yes, we are. Okay, let's try this. All right, so we're looking at cancellous versus, you know, cortical bone. So what happens when you start losing teeth? Well, the first thing that occurs is that you end up losing a great amount of width of bone as well as height of bone. And the resorption of this has to do with the recipient site. There is more resorption in bone that has a cancellous component to it, trabecular component to it than say cortical bone. So you will find more resorption very quickly in the upper jaw and the maxilla rather than in the mandible. So within a few months, right after doing the extraction, it is possible to lose two to three millimeters of bone height, maybe four to five of bone width. And the consequences of the problem is that you have difficulty with implant support and even crown and bridge in aesthetic restorations. The solution, socket grafting. It's a simple procedure. 
And in my opinion, socket grafting should be done every time that you remove a tooth. It will help preserve the buccal labial plates of bone. It's very simple, very predictable, and you just must have to follow the rules of bone healing. And the re rules are to remember that we are considering the rate of remodeling. So remodeling is a surface phenomenon. It varies from site to site. Trabecular bone obviously has a much greater surface area than cortical bone. So that bone is more rapidly resorbed. And that increases the loss of alveolar bone until we get down to, you know, to basal bone. So when I am doing a surgical procedure with implants and or a, uh, uh, a bone graft procedure, I want to know the ratio of cancellous compartment versus the cortical compartment. So if I have a lot of cancellous bone, I can do a split cortical graft and my bone graft is gonna be interpositional, which is the best because in that cancellous compartment are the cells, the nerves, I mean, the arteries, the veins, the blood vessels, you know, for healing. As we lose bone, then we have a less of a ratio between cortical to cancellous bone, more cortical compartment. And that's gonna drive me to be doing an onlay kind of a graft. It also has its component when we're talking about implant dentistry, because we know that placing an implant, say in the maxilla second bicuspid area is usually very, very successful. But placing an implant in the mandible when you've had a lot of uh, uh, resorption, you're ending up having more cortical bone versus cancellous bone. So from the CT scan, I want to look at cancellous versus cortical bone. So let's talk briefly about the structure of bone. We have here the cortical component. Lamellae has the osteocytes. Remember that the osteocytes now are the end stage of osteogenesis does very little to producing bone. The matrix is an osteoid material, uh, hydroxyapatite in all mammals. Uh, the mineral component is hydroxyapatite. But within that area too, that organic component in the, in the inorganic area, the, mass, the osteoid, we have type one collagen, glycosaminic lichens, other proteins like osteonectin and so forth. In the cancellous compartment, and we have osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and, uh, and blood vessels, very important. So when we're doing bone grafting and or implants, you have to remember that the marrow and the endosteum, where we have the stem cells, that's responsible for about 60% of our bone healing capability. The osteocytes may be about 10%. The periosteum may be a 30%, but that's usually in a much younger, you know, patient. But if you think back how we do bone grafting, onlay bone grafting, we lay back the periosteum, we decorticate uh, the cortical bone, we place our graft and stabilize the graft, and then we take the periosteum and you want to get primary closure. Well, obviously, the periosteum does not, does not split, does not uh, uh, spread. So in order to get primary closure from the inside, you fillet the periosteum so that you can bring your mucoperiosteal flap over and have it closed without tension. But the problem is once you've made that incision in the periosteum to fillet it and give it the mobility to move over the, the graft and or the implants, you open up the graft site to fibrovascular invasion. Well, that's not really a problem because now you can put a, an occlusive membrane you know, between that. But once you start doing that, you decrease the effectiveness of the periosteum, one by filleting it <clears throat> and by the other by putting in a membrane between the cortical bone and the membrane. So it comes back to the, to the uh, example that it is the marrow and the endosteum, which is the most important for our bone graft healing and such. So if we look at this slide, 
we see that there's a nice area, nice area of periosteum. We have good thick, you know, cortical bone and a large cancellous compartment. Wonderful bone morphology for doing implants and or bone grafting. As the teeth are lost, as we talked about in the previous lecture, that cancellous compartment is going to get less. It's going to resorb. Your ratio between cortical to cancellous bone is going to be much narrower. And now this gives us a lower success rate with our implants and definitely a lower success rate with doing a bone graft. Because at this point, you're probably not going to be able to split the ridge and you're going to be doing an on bone graft. And this becomes one of the most uh, challenging of cases because we end up having a very little cancellous compartment. And this is almost impossible. So there has to be other ways in order to treat patients that come with this amount of atrophy of the mandible and or the maxilla. The next item I want to discuss is the, I, the item of biologic width and biotype. Both are very important if you're going to have a successful implant supported prosthesis. So we'll start off with discussing biologic width. Now, the problem is, is that the implants only replicate a natural tooth. It's not a natural tooth. Uh, the implant and that mucosa bone interface only approximates the natural periosteum. There's no cementum or periodontal ligament around the implant. This is a rather interesting concept also because we find patients who have advanced periodontal disease after you take their teeth and you clean their mouth up, they actually do much better um, with implants. And the reason is that periodontal you know, disease is around a tooth is a disease of the cementum. Well, there is no cementum around an implant. So these patients do very well. There's less vasculature around the implant as opposed to a natural tooth. And the supracrestal connective tissue is not embedded into the tooth, is not embedded, it is embedded into the tooth, it is not embedded into the implant. There's only this parallel orientation around it. So the idea of biologic width is not a new concept. Um, Ingber and Rose did, uh, authored this article in 1977 and also the periodontal syllabus was done by Fiber, Fiberger in 85. And they propose that with doing crown and bridge, that there is a minimal dimension of three millimeters of a coronal to the alveolar crest that is necessary to permit proper healing. And Fiberger in 85 broke this down that we have one to two millimeters of the sulcus the junctional epithelium about one millimeter and the connective tissue attachment about one. So what we're looking at is trying to have a area of attachment of, of that biologic width of about three to four you know, millimeters. Now, biologic width, it refers to the response and requirements of cells that are comprised of dental gingival junction. While the biologic width is interchangeable with a lot of the teaching and nomenclature that we use in lecturing with dental implants, there is a different phenomenon that's involved. One obviously is a natural tooth and the other is the analog. So <clears throat> if we look at a tooth on one side and we see the implant on the other side, what are the similarities and what are the differences? If we look at the gingival sulcus, the epithelial attachment, and the connective tissue attachment. Well, the attached gingiva, basically about the same. Um, you might have difference in the elongation of the ready tubes that we find in the sulcus histiologic linings. Uh, but so they're longer, say, around a tooth than they are, say, around an implant. The epithelial cells are rather the same. And the base of the gingival sulcus is about the same, but it is below this base of gingival sulcus where things change that we have to be careful of because it 
influences how and where we place implants. So the remount of remodeling is necessary after we place an implant to reestablish that biologic width. <clears throat> if you're using a flat top implant, that if you put that flat implant below the level of the cortical bone, 100% of the time you're gonna get bone loss. So in order to have an aesthetic result, there are a couple things we used to do. We'd either put the implant so that the machine collar is above the crustal bone, thereby you know, having that dental or the biologic width you know, maintain, or we could put the implant at the crest of the bone. If the implant is placed at the crestal bone, that crestal bone is going to resorb three to four millimeters to establish biologic width. That is in fact the problem that we had in the early days when we were doing Branamark implants because their protocol was to put the implant below the level of the bone. And they found that when they were doing prosthetics that bone loss almost consistently, crestal bone loss lost about three or four millimeters of bone. And the reason for that is that the body wanted to reestablish biologic width. <clears throat> so those of us who've been doing implants for quite some time know that we have the process of manipulating where the top of the base of that implant is positioned to the cortical bone. So if you look at the interface on a flat top implant between the implant and the abutment, what you see here is even though this is tightened way down, there is a space. And to a bacteria, this is a Grand Canyon. And what you're gonna have here is a lot of endotoxins. So that in effect is what the problem is of placing your implant below the level of bone. This is a high resolution you know, X-ray and shows here what looks like in the influence of offloading, loading of the implant and the opening of the implant abutment interface. With no load, it looks like it's a wonderful procedure, but as soon as you do offloading, and this is about 30 degrees, you see that back and forth, you have opening. And that opening now is gonna be a production of endotoxins. So we have to look for an implant system that allows us to place the implants maybe below bone and be able to do platform switching without having a problem with the biologic width. So this is a, a, a case of mine many, many years ago with the Branamark system, putting the implant in. And we noticed that after a period of time, there is this epulis above the tooth. Why is it there? Well, it's there because of the bacterial invasion in that interface, the uh, endotoxins and loss of bone. So we have loss of bone at least to that area by just by using this implant and pushing it, placing it below the level of bone. However, these days we have the advantage of newer designs of implants with a sloping shoulder that allows the implant to be placed at least maybe a millimeter below bone and using platform switching as we'll show a little bit later, just on some cases. So next is the biotype. Not all biotypes are successful for doing implants. We have the, uh, the saying that bone sets the tone, but it is the tissue that is really the issue that we have, even if we have bone, we have to look at, at soft tissue. So we would like to have our cases like this, beautiful aesthetics. Uh, <clears throat> if we design or divide this beautiful aesthetic case, we find that is really in two parts. One part obviously is the tooth aesthetics. A lot of that has to do with the laboratory that you're working with. And the other is the gingival aesthetics. So how do we combine the two? What do we have to do in order to look at the case and make that beautiful aesthetic case possible. Well, <clears throat> one thing to do is to use an implant that does have a sloping shoulder. So because you can put that implant below the level of the bone, <clears throat> your abutment now is within the confines of the implant, which 
years ago we called platform switching is what we do now. And because of that abutment, you're able to have a much nicer anatomic cuff design with thicker tissue. The reason that's important, that if you go back to the article by Nozawa, that in order to support the papilla, there is a relationship between the horizontal support and the vertical support in about a 1 to a 1 1.5 you know, ratio. So what that translates to is that if we can have a anatomic cuff design that allows more horizontal gingival attachment, we will be able to support you know, the papilla. So if we look at cases now, we want to know what of the different morphology now of the biotype, what's going to give us the best results. Well, if we have thick bone and thick gingival tissue, this is the best biotype for implant aesthetics. But what if we have then thick bone, but we have thin tissue? So we're looking at thick bone and thin tissue. This biotype usually we find in the uh, posterior maxilla and sometimes in the posterior mandible. And we see here in the posterior you know, mandible and uh, in this case in the maxilla that we can put a wide diameter implant in. There certainly is enough bone, cover this and we will have a, an aesthetic result. The tissue will cover over. This is the posterior, you know, mandible, again, with thick crestal bone. It's a little bit different, though, in the <clears throat> aesthetic zone, where you may have to do some tissue grafting in order to find an aesthetic result. But it is possible to have that. But now, what do we do with a case that has a lot of tissue, but thin bone? Can we have, you know, good results? So we have thin bone and thick gingival tissues. Well, that will work if we're doing bone grafts. So that case can be grafted. Bone graft, you lay the flap, increase the width of bone, it's sometimes the height of bone, and you have enough bone circumferentially <clears throat> around the implant. But now we're presented with a case where we have thin bone, and well, that was thin bone and thick tissue, which is a very good procedure. But now we're presented with a case where we have thin bone and thin tissue. This is probably the worst combination. And you might consider doing three unit conventional bridges rather than placing the implant. Because once you do the implant and you think you have primary you know, advantage of the aesthetic zone, that gingival tissue over time is going to continue to resorb. So we have the peri-implant tissue that shrinks. Even though the crustal bone is good, the implant is fine, but the tissue is going to shrink and it's going to shrink down to where this is not an aesthetic result. So when we're placing implants, we want to think of what biotype to deal with. Now, if we have thick bone and thick tissue, that's good. We have thin bone and thick tissue or thick tissue and thin bone, we can always do something from a surgical standpoint. But dealing with the case of the biotype, in my experience of thin bone with thin gingival tissue, <clears throat> most often we're going to get resorption of the tissue um, and it's not going to be an aesthetic result. So I prefer to be suggesting more of conventional crown and bridge prosthesis in that type of biotype than in the other three that we discussed. The other is now, next issue is the biomechanical considerations, you know, for treatment. If you understand this formula, you understand implant dentistry. Stress is force divided by the area. Everything we do in implant dentistry is to decrease the stress on the implant and in the prosthesis, prosthetic. So you can decrease the stress because you have some power over the occlusion and the size of the, the teeth. And that was going to, I mean, if you decrease the force, you have influence over the occlusion. The surface area, there's only two things you can do. You can increase 
the number of implants or you increase the diameter of the implants. But everything we do is promulgated to how do we reduce that stress, both from a prosthetic and from a surgical standpoint. So this brings us back to a wonderful lecture by one of my mentors many years ago, Dr. Charlie English, um, who did a very nice paper on beam deflection having to do with natural teeth, but the same holds true when we're doing with implants. <clears throat> and that is to remember that the deflection of the beam is length is to the cubic cube of the length. The deflection of the beam equals is ratio to the cube of the length. So if we look at this slide and we see that we have a one unit bridge, the deflection is going to be one. If we increase it, the cube of the length is going to mean now we're going to have eight times the deflection. And if we make it as a three unit, you know, or three pontics, we're going to have 27 times the deflection. How does this then translate to implant dentistry? <clears throat> well, the fact is, is that if we place implants that are very far apart and we connect them with a the prosthesis, the further apart the implants are, you're going to have deflection of the beam. The deflection gets to the abutment. The abutment goes to the interface, down to the implant, and we end up with bone loss. So the idea here is to increase the number of implants so that we decrease the beam, the length of the beam. The other is the depth of the beam. In this case, the deflection is proportional to inversely the depth of the beam. So if we have a thicker beam here, we're dealing with a deflection of one. If we half that deflection, then we're going to eight times the deflection. And if we even go deeper, we're going to get 27 times. So what this translates very simply is that the worst phenomenon is to have a long beam and a very thin metallic structure that is supporting the beam. The worst would be a thin beam and a long extension. The best, obviously, would now be where the, the beam structure is less and the thick, we have a thickness of the supporting structure. So if we look at the implant now, we discussed in just briefly the previous slides that really gives us the idea that one thing to do is increase the number of implants, which will decrease the deflection of the beam. The other now is the width of the implant and the length, which is most important. The length of the implant is most important to give us initial stability of the implant. But it is the width of the implant that's going to give us some long-term success, and I'll show you why. So here we're looking at a diagram where the <clears throat> diagram shows an implant that's five millimeters in diameter and six millimeters in length, and it gives us a surface area of about 114 cubic millimeters. If we keep the diameter of the implant the same and increase the length, we increase the surface area about 14%. However, if we increase the diameter to six millimeters and we keep the length the same, we are then going to increase the surface area of about 24%. But what that means is, is that a wider diameter implant is going to give us better support for long-term success of the prosthetics within reason. And I'll tell you now what that reason is here. One of the things that you want to do is to have at least a millimeter, millimeter and a half, millimeter and a half is better, circumferentially around the implant. If you have less than a millimeter and a half, you have less bone, circumferentially around the implant and the top of the implant, the abutment is then interfacing with cortical bone. Cortical bone, remember, is the end stage of osteogenesis, does not repair well. And once you start losing cortical bone around an implant, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to regain that. So with placing an implant where you have less than a millimeter and a half 
around the implant, most often, most probably is going to give you bone resorption. So this was a study done some time ago, and we were looking at a five-year survival rate on two patient base. Both were 43 patients, 64 implants. The uh, implant diameter in the one case <clears throat> was 3.5 to 4 millimeters, which gave us at least a millimeter and a half circumferentially around it. If we use a wide diameter implant and it encroached on that cortical bone, the cumulative success rate was almost 81%. That is a 19% failure rate. And the only difference between the success of 96 or almost 97% in the failure is the amount of bone circumferentially of the implant. So these days when I am doing implants, I'm gonna look at the CT scan and I am not picking the diameter of the implant according to the prosthetic design. The initial idea was that we had a wide implant in the posterior mandible or maxilla, which gave us a better emergence profile. But that wide diameter implant encroaches on the cortical bone. So I select the diameter of the implant as well as the length according to that ratio of cortical versus cancellous bone. And I am looking at an implant that's going to give me probably a minimum of a millimeter. Most better, a better would be a millimeter and a half circumferentially around the implant. So when you're looking at any of the implant designs of any of the implant systems that you're currently using, you want to pick that implant that you're going to place in the bone within that cancellous compartment, at least a millimeter and a half. I'd like the millimeter and a half around the implant. And that's going to help prevent any type of bone loss. If you do that and you pay attention to the beam mechanics of length and depth, then you're going to have successful results. We'll talk a little bit about design and surface area and, and loading of an implant. What we have now in the design of implants is most are going out through a either a threaded design on the crest or a sloping shoulder part of it. So I think in the um, in worldwide literature, there may be now around close to 1300, 1500 different types of implants. And most are now are taking the implant design to give us a design of the implant that protects the bone <coughs> on the crestal region. That helps us you know, with the long-term success. So of those, say, approximately 1,300 different designs, they may have a different shape, the dimension, the surface area, uh, thread design, you know, may, may be different, but they all are able to work if we pay attention to the biomechanics of placing the implant. But we would like to have more bone attaching to the implant, that bone implant contact, or what we call as, as BIC, which we're going to talk about. So with these newer concepts, we have a biologic seal, either sloping shoulder or a little seal that helps seal the soft tissue. The <clears throat> thread structure in most of the implants uh, is a different pitch that gives us more of contact with bone. As we go further down the implant, that pitch and the length of the threads increase to get more stability. And the implants now have good thread design at the apex of the implant rather than say, remember the conical in shape, shape implants we had with integral or the IMZ you know, type implants. The other is, is that most implant companies are getting away from a flat surface implant, parallel surface implant, and going to an implant that's more conical. <clears throat> the conical implant gives us more uh, stress relation and does better under compressive loads. So here we're looking and we wanna see what's of that fixation design that will give us an increase in bone implant contact. And a lot of this has to do with, again, going back to see what is the cancellous versus the cortical component. And we're looking for an implant diameter and length dependent on what we see on the CT scan of the cancellous compartment. And we look for an implant that's going to give us the ability to help 
immobilize the implant both at the apical, middle, and in the crestal region. Both or all three of these are important to stabilize the implant. It's the key to osseointegration that if you have uh, stability of the implant, if the implant is not mobile, then you're probably going to end up with a good successful implant. So the new designs are done now to give us better retention at the apical portion, the middle portion, and also the crestal area. This is a sample of a flat walled or straight walled implant. This happens to be uh, the Stroman implant as opposed to a uh, conical shape implant. They're done in type three bone, type four bone, because you see there is very little uh, cortical compartment. But the conical shape implant is going to give us greater implant, uh, implant increasing the primary stability, which is going to give us a better success rate. So how do we do that? Well, we can do that by under drilling the implant site, placing the implant, which now compresses that cancellous compartment that gives us more stability. And in this situation, you see both at the apex and the middle part, and also at the crustal region. And notice the position of the biologic seal, which is in this case with the seal is going to be above the, or at the surface of the cortical bone, and if you had a sloping shoulder, you would put that of the design, you would put that, say, a millimeter below the bone. So how has it changed now our drilling protocol? Well, one thing you're able to do is delayed loading, where you do full drilling, self-tapping of the implant in, or delayed loading, where you countersink, and then you do self-tapping. Or what you can do is now pre-tap, the case. Look at the amount of cortical bone. And just what you want to think about is that in the late loading, you have a space between the threads and the bone. By self-compacting the implant in the bone, we increase the ability or the bone implant contact to give us better stability of the implant. Now, this is in type 4 bone. In type 1 or type 2 bone, where we have a thicker cortical compartment. We'll progressively do sequential drilling. We're going to put a four millimeter diameter implant in. We increase the cortical bone to three nine and then do a tap of the cortical component. And then we can self tap the implant. So at that cortical component, we have a very intimate relationship between the implant and bone. And in the cancellous compartment, we have self-compaction, which is going to give us increased stability. In this case, D1 or D2 bone, we'll do the drilling, and we're going to double tap. And the reason for this is to increase the bone implant contact. This is a long tap that goes the correct le the length. Remember, this is D1 and type or D2 bone. Then we'll tap the cortical area. And the reason for doing the tapping of the bone is that to produce an intimate contact between the threads and bone, which is extremely important to increase the bone implant contact or BIC. Now, the other is once these implants are in, <clears throat> is the insertion torque. You have to know what is the maximum insertion torque for the implant system that you are using. So if I put the implant in and I have an assertion torque of say 10 to 20 Newton centimeters, I'm gonna leave the implant heel for three, five, six months, have it submerged, then come back and put on the healing abutments. If I'm up around 20 or 30, then I will put on a healing abutment. If my contact, my bone implant contact gives me stability <clears throat> to about 30 to 40 Newton centimeters, I will be able to do this with immediate loading if I choose. I am not a big proponent of immediate loading. I like to go a little bit more slower. And as I mentioned in the interview, I find the slower you go, the faster you get there. 
especially for your patients that are paying a lot of money for your services, you want to have success. What you do not want to do is exceed the 40 Newton sonometers or the maximum torque for that implant design, because what that is going to do is give you compression necrosis. Most of the stress is concentrated here at the crustal bone. And as we talked earlier about maintaining enough with the bone circumferentially around the implant, if that implant encroaches on that cortical bone, cortical bone, again, end stage of osteogenesis is the quickest bone to resorb. So you're putting at risk where the stress is mostly concentrated and that's a crestal area. And the result of this is gonna be bone loss. So the implants were fine, but they were torqued too much. Over compression at the crestal area caused the bone loss. Now we're gonna look about the surface design. What we've done now with surfaces all the way from plasma spray to uh, RBA type two into acid etching. So let's look at this. Now, when we place an implant in bone, you gotta think about what is going on down there in that microscopic level between bone and implant. This is analogous to a fracture. You have actually fractured the bone by doing your drilling procedure. So the first thing that's gonna happen is that you're going to get these multinucleated giant cells uh, they're vacuum cleaner cells that clean up the debris that you've done with the drilling procedure. Red blood cells will come in. <clears throat> Your stem cells will come into that area. And they'll start giving our little fibrils that are going to attach to the surface of the implant. They want to attach to the surface and not retract, which is why the surface design and the surface area texture of the implant is so vitally important because along these fibrils is where you're going to find your stem cells coming, producing osteoblasts and forming bone. This process is going to take about three to six months. And what you're going to find here is an immature bone. It, it's a woven bone. So it is not easily stressed. And that's why I am not a big proponent of immediate load. I would like this to become a little bit more dense bone rather than that uh, soft bone. I want it to become more lamellar. So over a period of time, we're going to increase the bone. We'll get more bone around the implant, be in contact with that. And now we can place you know, our abutment. So if you place the abutment, then you can end up stimulating the bone. And remember all the way back to Wolf's Law that the implant now, the stress structures and lines will line up to the compressive nature of the implant within the bone and you'll have a much stronger implant. So what happens at that area where you get that, you're producing that bone fracture by placing the implant? Well, you end up producing in that cancellous compartment, a very dynamic state of cellular activity. You get platelets, leukocytes that all come into that area, proteins such as you know fibrin, <clears throat> very important to attach to the surface of the implant. And that all depends on this surface topography. So that surface topography promotes the absorption of proteins, adhesion, of osteoblasts and differentiation to osteoblasts and integration. So the surface topography is extremely important. So when we're using now an implant of various different implants, the surface topography of their implants could either be smooth, minimally rough, moderately rough, or rough greater than about two microns. So we're finding within reason that the greater the roughness or this SA greater than two microns, the rough surface gives us an increase in bone implant contact as opposed to say a smooth implant that has very little. So we are now being able to produce a different implant companies to produce a micro rough surface, either by grit blasting, titanium grit blasting, 
electrolytically enhanced, as we see here, or sandblasted and acid etched, or just acid etched. But the idea here is to change the surface topography so that the fibrils will attach to the implant, not retract, and we get better bone implant contact. Sandblasting, we see here either with aluminum or silica, we have the roughness of about two microns, acid etching, maybe about one. But if we combine the sandblasted area with acid etching, or the SLA surface, <clears throat> now we're seeing a roughened surface of about, maybe about three microns. Roughened surface is going to give us more bone implant contact. So this is done by taking the implant, spraying the implant, either with alumina or titanium, roughen the surface. And once you roughen that surface and you think you're enough to get that increase in roughness, then you're going to acid etch. The acid comes in and etches over the surface of the implant. And all this does now is increasing the roughness of the surface to give us a better form for the fibrils and osteoblasts to adhere to the implant. This brings us now to what we call the stability dip. Those of us who have been doing implants for quite some time know that the there is a difference between stability of the implant and osseointegration. So when you first place the implant, that implant is very stable. But a day, two days, three weeks later, that implant is less stable than the day you put it in. And the reason for that is what we just discussed. That is, you had the multinucleated giant cells at the interface. And before you start forming bone, you have resorption. There is no place in the body where bone formation and osteoblastic activity begins without osteoclastic activity. It is a coupled reaction. The first is osteoclast. The second now is then osteoblastic activity. So <clears throat> that bone loss that we see, that primary stability gets less and less over about maybe three weeks before we start getting new bone forming. And now we have secondary stability because we start forming bone with osteoblastic activity on the surface of the implant. And this gives us that stability dip. Now, the reason for the stability dip or for you to know about it is that in this area, I prefer in my practice not to place uh, implants for immediate loading because no matter what implant system you're using, there is a little bit of a dip in that area. And I want to maintain the implant stable in bone so I have the best amount of bone implant contact. So you see that in the practice, in my practice, that I use this most often as a no load zone. So this no load zone dissipates, goes down once the secondary stability begins, which is new bone, and we start forming more bone to give us better bone implant contact. However, we do have implants, as we talked about with the design, that will give us implant stability at the apex, the middle portion, and also in the crestal area. <clears throat> so if you can maintain the stability of the implant during this area of what we call stability dip, you can probably be safe in adding your healing abutments. But I would still be cautious in most cases of doing uh, immediate load. So with the newer design of the implants, you see the stability dip becomes much less. It doesn't mean that your implant is osseointegrated after those three or four weeks. It just means that the implant remains stable while osseointegration you know, is beginning. So let's go briefly, just a few, few cases. Um, I'm not gonna add a lot of cases here, <clears throat> just to show the normal procedure for placing the implant, the pilot drill. That also helps us detect the bone density. The uh, 
the cuff on top of the implant, the guide lets me know that, well, I know that this is 10 millimeters in uh, guide so that I'm not going to do more than 10 millimeters down below the, the, uh, the implant for the length. And I'll increase the width dependent on what I see on the CT scan to five millimeters and then use a th thread former. Threads the bone, you can see that by doing this, you see the threads and the osseous structure that are gonna to correspond to the threads of the implant. I like to wet the implant rather than placing it dry and place the implant. And I'm here now at about 30 Newton centimeters. This implant has sloping shoulder to it, so I can put the implant down about a millimeter below the level of the bone. Now, because it's about 30 millimeters, and also notice that the implant is below the crestal bone, and we are going to do platform switching when we do the prosthetics, I can now put my healing abutment that's going to shape the gingival tissue for the final crown. Months later, we see that the there's good bone. We don't have bone resorption. Take off the healing abutment, place the final abutment, and do a crown restoration. A nice emergence profile. And we find that if we display by the rules, this should be the type of case that you should see. In an area, say, of uh, an extraction, either in the maxilla, but mostly in the mandible, that if we have a tooth we're extracting, I want to know where I'm going to position the implant. I try not to take the tooth out until I do the drilling. So what I'll do is I'll take a drill at the cemento enamel junction, take the crown off, and now I see the bifurcation area between the two roots. And I'll use my pilot drill going into that bifurcation area Again, this stopper on the implant here is 10 millimeters. <clears throat> Usually in the posterior mandible, I, I don't place implants that are longer than 10. But I've prepared the implant site, leaving the roots in place, giving me a guide for the position. So we see here that now we have the structure, the drilling procedure for the implants. And I've also separated the roots. So with an, uh, an elevator, I can take out one root, then take out the other root. I'll do some grafting, place the implant. And because again, this is greater than 30 Newton centimeters with stability, I'll put on the healing abutment and suture. Easy, very successful case if you do this by just going by the rules. We're going to extract this molar, leaving a socket area filled with debris granulation tissue. And the first, obviously, we're going to degranulate the area and then do the drilling procedure to place the implant. But there are a lot of bone defects around the implant. So in this situation, we're going to graft, I'll graft, after placing the implants. And mixing either, I think this is autogenous bone that I took from an automatic chip maker, placing it in the defects. The implants are stable. I'll put on the healing abutments and suture. Again, this should be a rather routine case, playing by the rules of the dia knowing the diameter of the implant, the length, the quality of bone, cancellous you know, versus cortical bone. And notice there, now we have three implants, so the beam structure is going to be shortened, so we're not going to have deflection of the beam. In two weeks, take the impression, final abutments. Three weeks later, you know, we can seat the case. Now, this was done in 2012. The follow-up in seven years later, in 2014, and you see that the evaluation, we have good bone circumferentially around the implant. And to get this result is an accumulation of your understanding of the beam structure, 
the bone structure, cancellous versus cortical bone, the diameter and length of the implant, maintaining that millimeter and a half around the implant. Now, in this case, there was a, a extraction of a canine um, or, I mean, a central incisor. <clears throat> and in normal cases, you would probably, most docs would end up grafting, then coming back and putting in the implant. But you can put the implant in at the same time. The secret to this is once that, it, that implant has to be more towards the palatal region, and it has to be within the cancellous compartment. If you place a wide diameter implant and the implant is outside that cortical compartment, the outside the cancellous compartment, and also outside that cortical compartment, this does not work and the implant is going to fail. But because this implant is going to be within the cortical compartment, I can now place the implant. It's very stable because I have good stability at the apex, the middle portion, and at the crestal region to maintain, maintain stability, <coughs> enough so that I can put on the healing abutment. And in that defect, I'll graft. Now, whatever graft material you want to be using, uh, I probably were using sort of an allograft with uh, concentrated growth factors that are mixed. Cover that with a membrane. This membrane is a concentrated growth factor membrane after we draw blood and we spin that down and we can use this as a membrane and then suture well we've come to the end uh, i'd like to thank all of you for staying around listening to the lecture and i hope to see you again at another of my webinars or uh, podcasts where we'll talk about uh, zygo implants and pterygoid implants so I will stop sharing now. I think that's the reason to do. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. It was uh, so, so um, well explained all the procedures and all the scientific background behind the implants. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Uh, we have here some questions. The public was very, very interested. Uh, we have a lot of people sharing uh, uh, your uh, webinar. So uh, Dr. Andre Zuki uh, was asking, regarding the biological weeds, uh, where do you place the implant platform and what connection do you recommend in terms of internal connection, I think it's the question. Yes, thank you for that, for the question. and and. The position of the implant is dictated by the implant that you're currently using, the implant system. Uh, mm -hmm. If it is a flat top implant and you're in a non-aesthetic zone, then I position that implant above the crustal bone. In that particular implant in the aesthetic zone, I'm going to place it maybe just at the crest, knowing that I'm going to get some resorption and I'll probably treat the gingival tissue before. If we're using an implant with a biologic seal or especially one with a uh, sloping shoulder to it, then in the design, then that implant I will place a millimeter below mm -hmm. the crestal bone. Bone will grow over the sloping shoulder and your prosthetic abutment, it will be on uh, platform switching. Mm -hmm. Agree. Uh, another question from Dr. Hanum Jadun. Um, does the one or two state surgical uh, approach makes any difference in terms of success and longevity of the implant? I'm sorry, would you repeat that question? Does one state the one, yes. one yeah. or two state surgical approaches uh, makes any difference in terms of success and longevity? of the implant? Placing an implant, it's either as a one stage or two stage. Your success rate is going to be dependent on the cancellous versus cortical bone. So whether it's a one stage or a two stage, you have to maintain that stability while you're having osseointegration. The one stage implant gives you a much better result quicker in that okay. biologic width 
area, say, than a two-stage you know, implant, especially the ones where the abutment is above the crustal bone. Most of the time, I'm placing a two-stage implant, and that is really because I'm now using an implant that I can do platform switching and put below the level of the bone. A one-stage implant, I will do mostly, say, in the lower anterior region, where I'm doing a one-stage and the implant is thin, um, still keeping it within cortical bone, within cancellous bone. Yeah, I agree. Um, another question from Dr. Rupali Mehta Desai uh, that is uh, asking because you were saying that you were wetting the implant before uh, placement, and she was uh, she or he I don't know <laughs> was asking which solution do you use uh, for um, uh, wetting the implant? I don't know if she's asking if it's blood or saline or what do you use. No, and I tell you, the, uh, the reason I started doing this is that uh, one day as I was cooking and uh, having to clean up the sink. So if I take a sponge that is dry, then I'm not going to absorb all of the stuff that I'm cleaning up from the sink. But if I wet the sponge and squeeze it out, then I pick up a lot more of the material. That gave me the idea that I should be wetting the implant rather than making it dry and mm -hmm. give me a better surface area. I do not have any scientific uh, mm -hmm. information yeah. of which is better. Um, there's a Dr. Uh, Suniche uh, uh, Suzuki, who has published some very nice papers on the wettability of implants in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, you might look up Dr. Suzuki for that. But normally what do you use? Saline or blood or before? I just use saline. Saline, okay, yeah, just <laughs> I think that was the question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I just use saline, yes. <laughs> okay, um, another question from Dr. Tai uh, Jen Yudutz uh, Do you use uh, ISQ, implant stability caution uh, reader, uh, to take decision about one stage, two stage? I think is that is the question about the ISQ device. I stopped using ISQ as a reader. It gives me, in my hands, it gave me a lot of false posit uh, positives with this. And there was some very nice work done by Dr. Sil Park evaluating the ISQ with different devices. And he showed that you could put an implant in a block of dead bone, put it in a vise in the laboratory, and depending on the angle that you did the ISQ is going to tell you that your implant is solid, but obviously you could just move it right outside the bone. So I am not a big fan of using ISQ. I think that if we go back to the to basics of quality versus cancellous bone, let it heal for a period of time and then use it. The ISQ is important if you have an implant that you've placed that is uh, not very solid, and you want to evaluate it, so you can have the patient come back in another month or two and do an ISQ, and it may give you a different reading. Uh, to be honest, I will disagree with you. Okay. Um, <laughs> because I, I have a lot of research uh, about ISQ. I did my PhD uh, using ISQ and comparing different groups of bone generation in the uh, posterior superior maxilla, and I'm using for the last uh, eight years, and I think it's a, a very objective tool, at least to having the follow-up, and is the only objective way to, to measure the stability uh, after the implant placement, because the torque you only measure once, and the ISQ you can measure several times, and you have at least some uh, objective number to compare, uh, and to have uh, like a status, and, uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, I respect your, your opinion, uh, but uh, I have different uh, different uh, uh, way well, of thinking. The ISQ is very, uh, namely for for people that are not experienced. Uh, I think is a very great tool uh, to give us an objective way to 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 do the the follow up and even the um, the life of the implant because we can measure even after mm -hmm. twenty years if you remove the prosthesis, you can measure the ISQ. Of course, one value alone, it, it doesn't mean nothing, uh, 
but when you have together with torque, I only take the decision when I have both of the, the, the measures it's together. Um, yeah. I, I don't use only the ISQ or only the torque. I use the two together, and I have guidelines uh, that I, I will uh, um, publish because each different implant has a little bit different rules because the designs exactly. are different and the position. If it's, if it's all this uh, macro structure, micro structure will will, will uh, um, change the, a little bit the values of the ISQ. But in general terms, I think it's a very good tool for someone that is uh, not experienced. It's not your case, of course. Probably you, you read your ISQ in your brain uh, <laughs> because you already are so experienced with the implants that you know and you know the, 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 the conditions uh, before and during the, the operation because you have your experience. So for you, it's not so important. But for someone that is starting, I think it's uh, a way of uh, having something uh, objective. It's m in my humble opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think I have the last question, uh, also from Dr. Ahun Jadun. Uh, I think he's asking, because you were talking about drilling uh, protocols, uh, along with um, um, the significance of having different uh, uh, drilling protocols with different uh, bone densities. I think is that because the question is not very clear, but uh, um, if you can explain a little bit better, if you change the protocols according to uh, uh, the bone quantity and quality, I think it, is that the question? At, at least for, well, it was yeah. what I understood. So uh, <clears throat> I think what they're referring to is that, yes, I do change the protocol. Uh, not for the implant that I'm using, but for the morphology of the bone. So if I'm using an implant and there's a large cancellous compartment, then I will under drill the case. So when I'm placing, if I'm placing say a four millimeter diameter implant, I may drill it only to uh, less than that to drill, you know, before that. So that when I place the implant with the tapping, I, can pr I compress you know, the bone, I compress the cancellous bone, which is most important. In D1 bone, um, the, I will go to full length of the drill with the <laughs> bone tapping because the important point is to take the stress off of that bone implant interface. And if you torque it down and you squeeze it down very tight, you're going to get compression necrosis. So I do change the drilling procedure, but it's dependent on the evaluation of cancellous versus cortical bone. And depending also in the system of inputs that you, you are using yes. because of the design, the micro design. Um, <clears throat> so I think we finished the questions. Uh, yes. The, Dr. Tiger is it's, um, asking what kind of pressure do you have to, to, to do in the bone to cause necrosis? What will be the, the torque that you have to do to, to cause some necrosis in the bone? It's a nice question. In my uh, um, practice or in, in teaching, what I find most often is that women doctors, female dentists, do much better than male dentists. A male dentist, you know, is torquing this in and they're going, I can make this tighter. I can put it tighter. It's tighter and I have more <laughs> torque. Whereas if you have play by the rules and women, I think, play by the rules a lot better, you only want to torque it down according to the ability, the types implant that you want to use. In the implant system I'm using, that happens to be 40 Newton centimeters. So mm -hmm. I do not torque the implant down more. above 40 Newton centimeters. Other implant systems may be much long, much tighter than that. I think uh, the uh, Replace Select from now mm -hmm. used to be Stereos, now Nobel. I think that has a higher torque value. So it has to do with the thread design and the uh, it, and the implant system. And I think if you are not compressing the cortical, if you have a design that is uh, uh, more compressing the medulla than the cortical, you can go for higher torques. Because the problem of the necrosis, I think, is more on the cortical because it's less vascularized. Exactly. Vascularized. So yeah, it depends exactly. a lot on, on the design of, of the implant. Uh, namely, for instance, 
uh, any image implant from Megagen or the new BLX or they are designs that normally they don't compress a lot the cortical, they compress more the medullar. They have like uh, smaller cores and the big threads uh, that you have to adapt to the, the bone density, of course. It's not an implant to, to someone that is starting because you have to understand a lot the biology and adapt the, the protocols uh, um, with your uh, senses of uh, uh, clinical. Right. Uh, and um, that's, uh, you know, quite frankly, that's a nice reason for using Megagen. I uh, like their thread design and giving us more bone implant contact than threads. Again, but that's all dependent on your evaluation of cortical versus cancellous, you know, bone. Yeah, totally agree. So thank you so much uh, for your uh, enlightening session, for all your uh, availability to be here with us on a Saturday. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really thankful uh, that I could uh, host this session. I hope we can <clears throat> meet again in the future. And I will ask you as a final message, uh, because we have people from all around the world seeing uh, your uh, podina, uh, podcast and webinar. Um, I will uh, ask you for giving a final message for all the, the peers, not only doctors, but assistants and staff uh, that are dealing with this COVID uh, situation. And uh, please give us a, a final uh, message um, regarding this, what do you think, uh, will happen and if you can at least uh, motivate uh, the class to, to, to pass this, uh, this situation. Well, you know, I think the, the uh, those of us that are alive during the pandemic that we have now is that we're going to be looking at history in our own lives as before the pandemic and after, and after the pandemic. I, in my opinion, um, things are not going to be going back to normal normal being before the pandemic in the way we do our family structure, the way we do meetings, the way we do uh, hospital cases, uh, the way we do teaching. So one thing that is nice and especially doing the, the webinar like this is that we're taking the advantage of doing uh, remote learning from this. So instead of everyone getting four or 500 people closed in on a, uh, an area like an auditorium, we are actually reaching Many, many more docs, you know, doing the procedures like this. Um, I think going back to doing live surgical courses, um, I think we're going to be looking at 2021, maybe beyond before we have the ability, you know, to do that. I think a lot of it is going to be dependent on we get a vaccine and how effective, the, you know, the vaccine is. Um, but we'll see, you know, I mean. I know there are some problems in just family structure. I have four grandchildren and it's hard yeah. to now bring everybody yeah. over and have swim parties because there's no, so we change our lives. Yeah, we change our perspective. Uh, we uh, sometimes have to recenter ourselves and recenter ourselves to our family and to give priority to, to, to the things that really matter that sometimes we are a little bit right. Uh, I do find, uh, yeah, but I yeah. do find in order to survive this, I, I find myself drinking a lot more of good wine. <laughs> Try your Porto wine. That is also oh, very nice. You know what? I have I have two bottles of Porto wine that I got from Lisbon, from Lisboa yeah. some years ago. Yes, definitely. So thank you, Dr. Smiley. I hope we can meet in the future. Uh, eventually presentially and uh, thank you for your time your effort uh, your um, well uh, being uh, well, you know a person and uh, so, I think we can um, uh, talk presentially soon yeah let me say one thing more you have another lecture coming up by dr. Bach Lee um, who follows this uh, those of you who are listening I would stay around to listen to dr. Lee he's Bach Lee is a very fine surgeon and good presentator. Yeah, so, we will say. I, I will say also. So let's yes. pass to another uh, podium that we have today, and tomorrow we will have another one that I will be hosting to Dr. Anna Mansour from uh, United States. So uh, keep uh, seeing the Global Summit page, and uh, you can uh, assist all these uh, podiums for free, and it's very good for connecting uh, uh, people from all around the world. So thank you. And You're see welcome. you in the next one.
Thank Good. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.